Okay. Well, our, our um, planning team, as we talked about the programs for this semester, wanted to have something on the topic of home, homelessness. And at first we had, and of course, Ruth Burkall's name immediately came to our minds and we wanted Ruth to be there. Um, and we had also uh, considered inviting another lady uh, there in Winston-Salem who would tell us about her efforts in bringing about police reform in the area that affects the homeless folks. But uh, it did not work out for her to come and join us. Fortunately, Tom Halpert is very interested and in, uh, uh, way more aware than most of us on any of this police reform in terms of how that um, affects homeless people. So Tom is going to share with us a little bit about uh, not just Winston-Salem, but across the United States, um, a brief overview of some positive developments that are taking place. And after Tom has shared with us uh, on that subject, then we will introduce Ruth and turn things over to her. So Tom, you want to begin us, please? Thank you. I believe it could be said that a good measure of how humane a nation is can be seen in how it treats its weakest and most vulnerable members. By such a measure, the US seems to fall short, at least in the view of some people, especially when compared with Western Europe. When I listened to the news about police reform, the only thing I was really hearing was that absolutely nothing was happening in Minneapolis. And that was repeated very often on the news. So I wanted to find out what else could be learned. And I found some very hopeful things coming about. As background for this, um, I think you'll see the re relevance as we go on. In 1960, the US had over 600,000 people in mental hospitals run by the government. But during the 70s and 80s, almost all of these hospitals were closed. Um, it was hoped that new medication would help former inmates in these state hospitals function in society, but many neglected to take their medications. Now, <clears throat> roughly half of the mentally ill are homeless and the other half are in prison and neither group is receiving any kind of psychiatric help to, to speak of. The money saved, the billions saved from closing all these institutions went to reduce taxes and went to build more prisons. So it's clear that we have uh, a vulnerable population among the homeless. Um, what I'd like to do at this point is take us to Denver, Colorado in a STAR program that stands out. And their acronym is actually STAR, st standing for Support Team Assistance Response. Set up about a year ago, a team of two go out in a van responding to calls of low risk calls that come to 911. One of them is a medic, an EMS medic, and the other is a mental health clinician. Star has responded. Yeah, I'm listening to it now. STAR has responded to over 2,200 calls just in the last year. 
that would have formerly been dispatched to the police. No response has ever resulted in an, in an arrest. No police backup has ever been requested. Now they plan to double the coverage and double the area of the city covered. They will have four vans and six teams be on uh, available seven days a week. The estimated cost has doubled in size 3.4 million, 3.8 million, somewhere in that area. <clears throat> to give you a comparison, the Winston-Salem police budget is 75 million. It's practically a drop in the bucket for this STAR program. This program has the full support of the mayor of Denver, who said this, we know that alternative response works. It works at getting people, it works at getting people to help, I'm sorry, it works at, at getting people the help they truly need, and it works as at keeping our officers focused on preventing crime. Denver has become a national leader in alternative police response, and we're committed to staying on this path. Durham, North Carolina, close to us, is setting up a community safety department on Denver's model. And there is admiration at many places across the nation for what Denver has accomplished. Um, Greensboro and Raleigh are in planning stages. As to Winston-Salem, I just talked with Russ May yesterday and he knows of no program being pursued here, unfortunately. Another approach, Berkeley, California. Two years ago, a study was made and it was found that for traffic stops, people pulled over, African-Americans were pulled over six times as often as white people. Berkeley responded with a plan to officially shift it's the first US city to officially shift most traffic enforcement from the police to unarmed transportation workers. Removing armed officers from routine traffic stops will dramatically reduce the likelihood that traffic stops will escalate into tragic shootings. If we truly care about the homeless and the minorities in our community, I believe we cannot fail to support exploring alternative ways of adding to the kinds of things that can be done in place of the police. Um, I have known a homeless person here for quite a few years. He's now passed away, but I've, I've known how harassed he felt by the police. So that's what I guaranteed to say in less than 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, heavens, my phone's ringing. Anyway, thank you so much, Tom, um, for that. It's a huge subject. Okay, Miss Ruth Bacall, and I would say that most of us know Ruth. She's a member at Unity Moravian uh, and former director of our Board of Cooperative Ministries. But six or seven months ago, is that right, Ruth, is when you changed? Uh -huh. Six months. Been six okay, months. six months ago. She now leads the City of Dwellings. Uh, there in Winston-Salem. 
And last month, if you were able to participate in any of the um, mission Sunday school presentations, then you would have heard Ruth as she had the opportunity to talk about the work of City of Dwellings. Tonight, we're gonna to follow up on that and she's going to, to give us a deeper dive into this whole topic of homelessness. What are the root causes of this, some, some of those causes? What about us? What can we do? What role can we play in addressing this very difficult issue? So Ruth, we turn it over to you now and say thank you so much for joining us once again at Home Church. <laughs> and I assume that folks will be able to ask questions at the end. That be oh, all yeah. right? Oh, Good. Yeah. Okay. All right. We'll turn it over to you then. Absolutely. Well, and I appreciated the, it, I mean, it just ended up because Mally asked me about Sunday school. So I ended up kind of with both asked about the same time. And so it, this has been great because preparing for a, a speaking engagement is a great way to learn, right? So, um, and, and thinking about that deep dive, I've been able to do some really good, I think, research and reading and talking with others um, to hopefully provide some things. And I know many of you were at the Sunday school uh, event a few weeks back and hopefully you'll hear some repeat, but it won't be too much repeat. I think a lot of it will actually be maybe new information. So, um, <clears throat> so I'm going to, hopefully everybody can see my blue screen and, um, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about, uh, some of the, I guess, um, subtleties and the ecosystem of homelessness. Um, and I do appreciate Tom's remarks. I think they were right on track. And, um, and uh, I'm actually gonna talk a little bit about deinstitutionalization too, because that certainly is a factor here in what we're talking about. But, uh, but I'm gonna certainly start with one of my very favorite topics, which is me. Um, I, uh, I, uh, this is me at four, Sassy Ruth, I like to call this photo. Um, I think I still look very much the same, right? Um, I'm still very youthful. And I would say that I've lived a charmed life, much as my patent leather shoes would indicate there. Um, I've had a great career, um, really enjoyed working with my beloved Moravians for almost the last 10 years, um, owned my own business for a while, worked for Mayor Wood in the city, um, got a lot of really good work experience. I've raised two beautiful children who are actually fully functioning adult humans, which I consider to be quite a, an achievement. But I have to ask, do I owe all of this to my amazing intellect and my sparkling personality, my natural leadership skills, all those things? I actually don't think so. I think it has more to do with my PCEs. Now, I know PCEs, what am I talking about? Well, I'm actually talking about positive childhood experiences. And you're like, Ruth, what does this have to do with homelessness? Well, just go with me here. Um, positive childhood experiences. These are the, the things that um, happen to us as children that help make us more resilient in the world, right? And if you look at them, there are seven shown there. Maybe you can sort of in your head tick off the how many of them apply to you. I, I, you know, did you feel able to talk to your family about your feelings growing up? Did you feel that your family stood by you during difficult times? Did you enjoy participating in community traditions? If you're Moravian, I know you check that one. Did you feel a sense of belonging in high school? Did you feel supported by your friends? Did you have at least two other folks who weren't your parents who took a genuine interest in you? If you were Moravian, you could check that one too. Um, did you feel safe and protected in your home by the adults in your home? So I have to report a seven out of seven for PCE. I, I feel that I am very fortunate in that regard. Um, not everybody can report that many, but PCEs go a long way in building resilience for folks. Um, likewise, um, ACEs or adverse childhood experiences um, are kind of do the opposite. <clears throat> and um, this is probably uh, 20 years ago now, Kaiser Permanente did a, did a huge study where they screened over 30,000 folks, I think it was mostly in California, uh, around what they called adverse childhood experiences in three different categories, abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction. And they're sort of shown there, um, but of course there are many more kinds of adverse childhood experiences than these, but they were representative. And so if many of us, if we were to do a checklist there again of the 10 different initial screening for ACE, we call it ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, 
Um, um, many of us, regardless of how we grew up or where we grew up or what, how much money we had or whatever, uh, might have a score there. Um, uh, and it might be more than one or two or three or even four or five. Um, and if that's the case, um, ACEs can have a very negative lasting effect, especially if you don't have the positive childhood experiences to kind of balance that and offset that, right? If you don't have the resilient building experiences to sort of ward off the adverse childhood, uh, you can, it can really be difficult later in life. So people who have four or more ACEs, they're two to five times likely to develop clinical depression, substance abuse disorders, suicidality, and this one I was always, I've been real surprised about chronic health conditions, things like diabetes, cancer, cardiovascular respiratory diseases compared to people with no ACEs. So adverse childhood experiences can really affect your life in many ways. Um, it, it actually increases the likelihood uh, that you will not complete high school, the more ACEs you have, of having a college, of not having a college degree, of being unemployed at some point as an adult, of living below the poverty line, and of course, uh, depending on how high your ACE score is, experiencing homelessness is a much greater possibility. So, so now I've gotten to it, um, and I'll just show you this, this little thing, which basically shows you that as your adverse childhood experience score goes up, the higher it is, obviously, uh, the greater your chances of struggling with homelessness as an adult. Um, and so, uh, <laughs> So you've got that piece of it. Of course, folks who have been involved with the criminal justice system or have been addicted to certain substances uh, or have been engaged with homeless services, 85% um, of those folks have experienced some kind of trauma as children. And I don't think we can underestimate the impact that that has just on society and the fabric of our society. Uh, not to mention that homelessness in and of itself is traumatic. Um, yeah, being homeless, losing everything that you have, having no connections, all those things can, can of themselves be quite traumatic. Um, if you're taking notes, if you have a piece of paper and a pen nearby, I'd like you to just find a corner on that piece of paper and number one to five for me. <clears throat> I want us to do a little activity around connection. So when you think about the connections in your life, so the things that are really the most meaningful, the relationships that are meaningful, um, the kinds of things that you do that form valuable connections, jot down five of those for me on that little list. Um, I'll show you mine. These are the ones I jotted down as the connections that really are feel really, really meaningful in my life. Just take a minute and jot down the five kind of areas of meaningful connection for you in your life. <clears throat> you might get a little trickier as you get down the list a little bit, right? It's a little harder to come up with things, but um, I, I could have probably gone on six or seven when I think about those major pieces of connection in my life and world. Um, there's several things I didn't even really get to. Um, but now I'm going to ask you to lose one. I'm so sorry. But if you had to lose one of those connections, you, it wouldn't be part of your life anymore. Which one would you be most willing to lose? Just go ahead and bite the bullet and cross one of those off that list. I'm going to take away music much as that pains me. Okay, well, we're down to four. I'm afraid the bad news is you're going to have to, you're going to, have to lose another one. So if you could figure out which which additional connection you're going to let go of okay so we're here we're down to three <clears throat> well they're very important all of those are very very important to me i don't know how in the world i would i would drop one of those but you know what i'm gonna have to 
drop one of those final three. Mm. There goes church. I hate it, but I'll still see my friends. So we can still do churchy things together, right? Well, I'm afraid you're going to have to pick between family and friends now, between your last two. Pick one, pick one more to go, go away, to let go of. And you're left with one and it's probably really a non-negotiable, right? It's probably one of those that's just no way you're gonna let go of that. If you're homeless, you're, you're gonna let go of that. So cross that one out too. When you become homeless, by the time that happens to you and you lose your home, these connections have all gone by the wayside for one reason or another. Um, and this is a pretend game. So it's over. So you can, you can uncross out those connections. You can know that they're in your life, right? You can restore those connections emotionally in your head, right? Um, but restoring connections for folks who are homeless is much more challenging. Uh, it takes a lot of hard work to restore and maintain their connections or build new ones. Oftentimes, um, they really have lost a lot of trust, the idea that the world is an unsafe place where nothing is permanent and no one can be counted on or trusted is, is pretty standard in their world. And they become more and more isolated. They get more and more vulnerable um, to being taken advantage of, to being um, having violence committed against them, to drug and or alcohol use and abuse. Um, it is really, really difficult. Uh, you don't just lose your stuff. Uh, you lose all the things that mean something in your world. Um, and so um, trauma is, is really cannot be underestimated in terms of the, the role it plays as both a cause and an effect really of homelessness. Um, and I started with sort of this individual story because really oftentimes that's where we start when we think about homelessness. We, we, we often find it easier to blame an individual, uh, even someone who's just had a run of bad luck, right? Or had a really hard life. We start there with that individual state uh, rather than taking a more honest look at some of the systems and structures that absolutely have brought us to where we are today um, as it relates to the homelessness ecosystem, basically. This slide sort of illustrates, like I said, some of the, up at the top there, the top of the tree, you're seeing some of the, the individual types of traumas or the individual kinds of, of adverse experiences. But under the roots there, you're seeing some of the community pieces, right? Some of the things that are part of the very roots of our community um, that are pervasive um, and that lend themselves really to uh, creating a, a whole series of different problems in our society and in our world today. Um, and so that's what we're going to try to unpack a little bit um, uh, is, you know, figuring out, you know, homelessness. I think I ended my last talk by saying homelessness is not the problem, um, but it is, there are many, many, many problems that contribute to homelessness. But homelessness is actually a state of address, right? Homelessness literally means we have no house. Um, some people might say, oh no, homelessness is a mental health problem, right? And it's true, about a third to a quarter of homeless folks have severe mental illness like schizophrenia or bipolar or severe depression. That's quite common. Um, there are those who say homelessness is a substance abuse problem. Uh, the use of opioids, fentanyl, heroin is on the rise. It's absolutely a substance abuse problem. Uh, and in fact, the National Coalition for the Homeless has, has found that 38% of homeless people are alcohol dependent. That's almost four in 10. And 26% are dependent on other, other drugs or other harmful chemicals. Um, so absolutely, substance abuse is an issue. Um, so there are those who say, oh, this is, it is absolutely a laziness problem. These people just don't wanna work, right? Um, but actually, 44% uh, of unhoused Americans performed some kind of work for pay in the last month. Um, and many more are just so vulnerable and their health is so fragile that they really are physically unable to work. Um, so all these pieces are, you know, part of homelessness, 
but it really is much more layered than that. And at its core, homelessness is a housing problem. That is what it is. Homelessness is a housing problem. Um, I mean, think about it. We, we all know folks, we know folks, we have family members and friends with mental illness who've battled substance abuse, who, um, who've had work challenges, right? Who've struggled in their lives. And yet most of them are sitting in our suburbs uh, in our warm homes and we've managed uh, to make it. Uh, homelessness is really about de-housing and it's de-housing that has taken place over time um, through policies, failed program responses. Um, and this is really where the individual issues come into play, right? So for example, if you've got a very tight housing market, then that accentuates vulnerabilities, right? So individuals with lots of vulnerabilities, like our friends who are unhoused, um, it, becomes, it becomes a sorting mechanism and they drop to the bottom, right? Um, so let's take a look at some of the societal impacts that I'm talking about here. <clears throat> we really have come quite a long way from the era of the hobo who's pictured here, right? Remember the hobos that were uh, riding the rails and heading out to the West for the big adventure. Um, uh, and, and we really have uh, come a long way from there. The boarding houses, right? Where, you know, Mrs., Mrs. Jones who ran her boarding house and the hobos stopped at the boarding house. Um, Deinstitutionalization, which Tom referenced, um, which I associate with the Reagan era when the mental hospitals were basically emptied out. And the idea was that there were gonna be community supports there that were supposed to be funded, um, which actually never got funded. Um, so the community supports weren't there. Um, to receive all these folks into the community. And family and friends found themselves pretty ill-equipped to manage care and needs of their loved ones coming out of a, a mental hospital. Um, and so what ended up happening though, from a housing perspective, um, uh, they call it SRO or single room occupancies. That's the boarding house rooms, right? Where you go and you rent a room. All of those got taken up by these newly released folks um, from the mental institutions. Um, and so there was this ripple effect. It basically displaced all the, kind of the other folks, the single men who were wandering around and um, folks who uh, generally were fairly transient in their life. It actually displaced them. So there was a bit of a ripple effect because of the deinstitutionalization. Um, so deinstitutionalization was is, has been a factor in sort of starting it off. And now, um, in recent years, you would basically see what's reversed is there was quite a lot of folks living in mental institutions and very few homeless. And today you'd see the opposite where there are quite a lot of homeless and very few actually in an institution. About the same time, um, cuts were made to government assisted housing programs uh, that started to be less popular. Um, you think of the, the really high, the high rise buildings, right? You know, the pub, the projects, um, those were not a success. They were tended to be crime ridden, uh, but rather than sort of focus on creative solutions, uh, the government really just stopped, stopped spending their money on that. And so they, there, there was less government assisted housing available. Uh, about the same time, redlining is also happening. Um, and if you haven't been to the public library down, down, downtown, uh, there's a great exhibit there right now on redlining. It's there through February, I believe. Um, redlining was the practice of, I guess, real estate markets to keep folks of color or certain ethnicities out of certain neighborhoods in order to keep the prices high. Um, and of course, there was other active discrimination, as we know, going on. So certainly we could do a whole presentation about institutional racism and the role that it played uh, in, in housing. And right now, I would say, absolutely, Black people and Black men in particularly are disproportionately represented in our homeless population, certainly in the Winston-Salem area. And, and that is certainly not a, a random act. Um, we can't forget the war on drugs, also happening around that time, the 80s, the 90s. Um, where it was just, and it kind of goes hand in hand with the Clinton era's three strikes and you're out, right? Where we put folks in prison for a nickel bag of pot. Um, and those things basically had the effect of criminalizing a lot of folks who may not have been part of the system. And, um, and you know, you can't get a lease. You can't get, you can't rent a place 
if you've been in jail, if you've got a criminal record. So um, certainly that played a role. Um, all of this, you know, kind of created a problem. But but on top of that, layered on top of all these different things happening, um, public attitudes began to shift around who deserves support, right? Uh, we, we sort of started with that welfare queen image, right? And um, um, people, you know, not deserving things and sort of the tide of public support sort of began to turn um, against welfare and government assistance. Um, and our social safety nets became a little more porous um, and a little more or a little less reliable um, as a result. Uh, and then finally, um, more recently, we're seeing uh, the criminalization of homelessness, which is the idea of like the loitering laws, don't, don't hang out here, the anti-panhandling um, laws, or, or they'll make him jump through bunches of hoops. Hey, you can panhandle, you just gotta fill out these 10 forms and show us your ID to, and, and come on a certain date and time in order to make that happen. Uh, I know, I think it may be Asheville that has had some uh, difficulties around feeding folks who are experiencing homelessness in public parks, that has been outlawed. So there's a, there's an effort generally that's been happening in the last decade or so to criminalize homelessness. So not only have we do we not have shelter for these folks, but we're basically making it illegal for them to not be sheltered. So, um, so those are all pieces that we don't necessarily think of when we think about homelessness, and yet all have played a significant role. Um, in homelessness. Um, and then the other side of this here is the housing side. So there are challenges around housing in general. And there are a few areas in particular that are worth highlighting. Of course, a lot of us talk about the lack of affordable housing. And absolutely, there is a shortage of safe, affordable rental homes. Uh, right now in Winston-Salem, we're short 16,000 units of affordable housing. That's units. Um, and, and truly, it's, it's not much different across the country. For every 100 low-income households of people, there are only 21 housing options available for them. So we've got 100 households, not people, households, but there are only 21 affordable housing units available for them. Um, and, and just so you know, for the record, affordable housing means that the rent is less than 30% of someone's income. So you take your income and what's your rent, and you know if that's if that's less than thirty percent of your income, then it's considered affordable housing. Okay. Um, another piece of this is similar to the earlier slide where I talked about the housing assistance programs, but like I said, we we cut back earlier in the eighties and nineties, and we never really ramped it back up in any significant way. And so housing assistance programs are woefully sort of underfunded and under available. Um, the waiting list is very long uh, for things like housing choice vouchers, which is what they used to call Section 8 housing. Um, and you can fill out all the paperwork, which is, you know, this thick um, and requires really a lot of help. It's really hard for someone to do it on their own. I'm not sure I have a master's degree, but I'm not sure I could do all the housing paperwork by myself. Um, only ends up with about 25% being able to actually receive assistance. So you can fill out the form all day long, but that doesn't mean you're going to get help. Another piece that we're hearing more about lately with COVID particularly is evictions. Um, <clears throat> once, and once you're evicted and have an eviction on your record, just like having a criminal record, it's near, nearly impossible to get uh, a new lease to, to be able to rent again. Um, the moratorium on the eviction uh, has lifted. That lifted, I think, in the maybe late summer, early fall. Um, and we, I will say anecdotally, we at City with Dwellings are seeing a lot more families um, who are living either in their car or on the street. Um, and it's a direct result of the moratorium being lifted. Um, and um, I mean, that's significant because in Forsyth County, 38% of households are rental households in Forsyth County. So it's quite a large group of people who are renting their houses, but evictions accounted for about 80% of all the housing loss in the county. So you got 40% basically of the, of the population of households renting but 80% of all housing loss uh, comes from evictions. And that was pre-pandemic. So um, we're, you know, the numbers are still just starting to come in in terms of where we are now. Um, but eviction is a huge problem and uh, will continue to be. 
Um, this one is a really big one too, and it's what I'm calling the rent burden. And this is related to the percentage of someone's income that they need to spend in order to have a decent house. Um, there's such a thing as the housing wage. And in order for someone to be able to afford to rent a two bedroom rent, rental house, you need to be making $21.21 an hour. Okay, that's, and that was five years ago. So I'm sure it's higher than that now. My guess is it's closer to 23 or $24 an hour. But $21 an hour is what you need to make in order to afford a two bedroom rental home. The average renter in Winston-Salem earns $16.38 an hour. Okay, do that math. <laughs> okay, that's about $34,000 a year. Okay, none of the folks that we see, and we have folks who have income, but none of the folks that we see have any income that comes anywhere close to $34,000 a year, um, which is the, like I said, the average renter's um, salary. Um, in Winston-Salem, the average monthly rent is $1,000.68, $1,068. That's the average rent. I will say, based on this, my son, who has a bachelor's degree and a full-time job, cannot afford the rent in Winston-Salem, he'd have to have a roommate. There's no way he could do it on his own. Um, when you think about the extremely low income renters, 66% um, of them are spending more than half their income on housing, okay? So the very low income, this is gonna be folks who are probably earning less than minim around minimum wage or maybe $10 an hour at the most. Um, they're with spending over half of their income, 50% of their income on rent. Um, and another huge aspect of this is that wages aren't increasing, but rent is, right? So rent's gone up, um, you know, in the past couple of years, it's gone up about 6% here in Forsyth County, but wages have decreased for about a third of our residents in Forsyth County, okay? So um, this is not sustainable. This is just not a sustainable situation here. Um, because a lot of our families are already living close to the edge, right? Um, a recent survey in North Carolina found that a quarter of our households were what we call housing insecure, meaning they're really just a rent payment away from being homeless, right? They, they either miss their rent or they miss their mortgage last month or they don't think they'll be able to pay this month. So that's 25% that's of households in North Carolina that, that are housing insecure. And of course, what happens is any kind of simple thing. They don't make the rent or the rent goes up. The rent goes up $25. That could be enough to throw them over into not being able to afford it. So then what happens is they end up being evicted. They couch surf. Maybe they double up with friends or family for a while. Then they're living in their car and then they're on the street. Um, it's, 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 it's a pretty quick turnaround sometimes. So um, so I'll show you one little chart that I found, and this is, comes from a book called Housing is a Homeless Problem, uh, and it's actually coming out in March, but I've heard the guys speak, and it's, it's quite good, but this makes the point really well. If you look at um, the median rent, which is across the bottom there, right, as median rent, monthly rent goes up, what else goes up? The homelessness rate, okay? And you can see that it's quite startling, and that makes a lot of sense when you think about it. I mean, sometimes folks will say, well, that's, the homelessness rate's high here because of substance abuse or this or that or whatever. But when you look at differences across geography, it's more likely to be about rent. It's more likely to be about rent than anything else. Um, and this makes that point, I think, very, very well. So, so I laid all that on you, and believe me, there's way more to talk about. Um, but I want to do, I do want to talk a little bit about some solutions, right? Some ideas about, so what do we, what in the world do we do about this? Um, and, it, and certainly we can do things like work to increase system capacity, which I will say the homeless services system, of which we are a part, is pretty overwhelmed and growing more overwhelmed every day. Um, we could do a better job of collaborating with, and coordinating with each other and agencies, um, things like that. We could, we need to be working to address the root causes of adversity, some of these societal impacts. Uh, although, frankly, I will say we're so busy from a day to day just serving the needs of our neighbors. I don't know when we would ever get to be working on, you know, institutional racism and poverty, but someone ought to be addressing that. Uh, advocacy in general, right? Just educating each other and um, talking about these issues is important. 
Um, really, there needs to be policy change on the local, federal, and the state levels at all levels. Um, they all have a role to play here. Um, it would be great if we could find a way to incentivize increasing the housing supply at the local level. That's not going to be true. That's going to be pretty tough to do. Um, landlords are not very incentivized these days, particularly with the housing market so tight. Uh, I'm not, they're not going to rent it to one of our folks when they can rent it to somebody who's got a job and, you know, and has, a, has never been evicted, right? Um, working on improving the social safety net. And when I talk about the social safety net, I'm talking about cash assistance, food support, child care support, health care, housing assistance. Studies show that folks who do receive more than a few of these kinds of assistances do better, right? They're much more likely to be able to be living above the poverty level to just some enough of a degree to keep them above water, right? So uh, figuring out how to improve the social safety net would be useful. Um, maybe thinking about some kind of universal housing assistance where everyone who's eligible actually gets assistance, which is not what we have right now. Um, more housing, obviously, more safe, affordable, stable housing of any kind of size or shape or form would be great. Um, being able to move beyond either or conversations, right? It's a person's fault versus it's the system's fault. Maybe we could have some both and conversations. Um, those would be, that would be helpful. And it would be wonderful to be able to really involve those who have lived experience in the problem solving, you know, what was it? What would have what would it have taken to have kept you in your place, right? How could you have stayed at home? What would what needed to happen so that you didn't end up on the street? Learning those kind of things in conversation with those folks who are living it can be can provide some really interesting insight instead of sort of sitting over here and deciding how we're going to help these really poor poor people, right? Um, and then, of course, the, vi the visual, which I haven't really even addressed yet exactly, is sort of the, uh, the upside of the trauma tree that I showed you earlier. You know, it's how can we as individuals and families and neighborhoods and communities work together to build some resilience, right? Build resilience for individuals, build resilience for our community, um, you know, and just help, help folks realize they can be part of their solution and we can all work together um, to, to help everybody have a little more control over their physical, social, economic, cultural, spiritual environments, right? So there's a lot more we could talk about. We could talk about the barriers to housing folks, right? We could get into all of that. We could talk about the cost to communities of homelessness because it is tremendous. Um, we could talk about the homeless services system itself, which has got plenty of layers and complexity. Um, we could talk about the need for things like medical respite, a lot of our population are aging. You know, if you live under a bridge and you have Alzheimer's, who is taking care of you, right? How does that work? So there are lots of gaps and needs. Um, and the more needs folks have, the higher the inequalities as well. And the higher, the more difficult it is to access what needs to be accessed. Um, but I'm going to, you know, take us away from all this sort of pie in the sky, a little bit depressing, big picture stuff, and talk a little bit with you about City with Dwellings um, and, and sort of share a little bit about what we're doing here on a local level. Um, and some of you have heard this, but hopefully you'll be okay to hear this, some of this again. But um, City with Dwellings is a local nonprofit. Um, we began in 2012 as a loosely organized group of volunteers providing overflow shelter, emergency shelter in downtown church facilities. And the Reverend Russ May, who's a good Moravian and the founder of Anthony's Plot, was very instrumental in organizing the original group and is still involved and is on our board. Um, and we did that for several years. Then in 2017, they incorporated as a 501c3, and we've sort of expanded our work beyond that emergency shelter winter season um, and are working in a variety of ways. And what I want to share with you now is I want you to hear Lee's story. This is Lee, and um, he is going to talk a little bit about his experience with City with Dwellings. It's only a couple minutes and hopefully I'm gonna to go to my website and pull him up. And hopefully everybody will, Margaret, if you'll give me the high sign, if you can hear this, okay. How y'all doing? My name is Lee McKeithen. Um, I just wanna share a little bit of my experience being homeless and now being here at the, um, the hotel. You know, um, when I was homeless, I, I didn't know where I was gonna sleep. I was drinking every day. Um, 
I was really destroying my body and my mind because I was just out there using, you know, um, I didn't have nowhere to stay. I, the last day I stepped on the back wall by Crystal Tiles outside, and um, it was raining and stuff like that. It was, it was just doing bad. And um, this, this hotel and city of dwellings, they came to me to, to help me because I didn't know where I was going to get help at. I was stuck just out there using it. I thought that was the answer, just keep drinking so I could suppress my feelings and, and the issues I was going through. But you know, when they came to me with this, going to the hotel, I was telling um, some of my friends, this is like a godsend because I didn't know which way to oh, turn and which way to go. So it was like a godsend. God answered my prayers without me even, um, you know, having anything to do with it. You know, um, I was telling four of my friends I used to hang with every day. We got named Terry, Chris, John, and Henry. I said, man, God snatched all of us up and put us in this, in this hotel at the same time, almost the same day. Matter of fact, um, John came a little after. And, um, and we hung together every day. So I know God has something to do with this. You know, um, I'm just, I'm happy to be here, I'm blessed. I haven't drank any alcohol in five weeks. You know, um, I'm feeling better, I'm doing better. Um, everything going on, everything is going well. And um, they're trying to work on housing for me when, when we do have to leave here. You know, and that's a blessing because I didn't know how I was going to do this thing. Um, they told me today they was gonna help me reapply for my food stamps, you know, help me with my disability, and um, get my ID, my social security cards. This thing that if I was out on the street, I would have took time out to even do, you know. Um, so it has been a blessing, you know, and everything happened for a reason, and you know, and I'm happy because you know, I couldn't have did it by myself. I just couldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't have did it. So that's Lee's story. Let me just put this back together here for you. Um, and Lee, is, he talks about the hotel. He's obviously in a hotel. During COVID, we couldn't do the um, we couldn't do the regular shelter, the congregant shelter that was um, you know the in the churches um, that was just not safe at that point in time. So we were able to actually work with several other agencies. Sorry, I'm getting this figured out. We were able to work with several other agencies and um, and actually um, create a, what we called the medically fragile hotel. And um, it um, it accommodated. We eventually had 51 people, I think, that went through the medically fragile hotel, and they were folks uh, like Lee who um, <clears throat> had some health conditions. I think I think Lee had diabetes, um, and so we were able to get. It had individual rooms. They had a nice warm bed. But the really good thing was we were able to keep them during the day as well. They were able to stay inside during the day as well, and so we were able to work with them on a variety of things related to independent living skills. We were able to work with him, like he mentions his paperwork um, and talking about applying for food stamps and disability. And we were able to work with him on all those things. And we did end up actually housing about 50 folks out of the hotel um, as they left that hotel and they were able to get into housing. Um, sadly, Lee died this past summer, um, but he was in his own apartment when he died. So he was, he was able to be housed. Um, he was quite a character for sure. Um, so uh, to be more specific about City with Dwellings and the work that we do, um, part of what we do is what we call diversion and outreach. And diversion basically simply means we're trying to divert people from homelessness. So if we have someone who shows up at our space or we run into them out on the street uh, and all they need is a bus ticket home to their mama in Oklahoma City, well, then we're going to help them get that. Um, and, and that's great because it does keep keep them at this point in time, potentially, from being homeless. Uh, our outreach staff do work with our street homeless population or our unsheltered homeless. Um, in Winston-Salem right now, there are 254 folks who are actually um, unsheltered living on our streets. Unsheltered means basically they're living somewhere that's not fit for human habitation. And our outreach staff goes to them. There are plenty of encampments or places under bridges or in abandoned buildings, parking decks, where these folks stay, um, they some of them move around quite a bit, um, but we check in with them. We um, try to help. We work with first responders. I will say, Tom, there's a great downtown bike patrol uh, with the police department. 
that really works hard to build community with these guys and works hard not to arrest them, uh, not to criminalize them. And, um, you know, and it's because they've taken the time to work with some of the rest of us to understand these folks specific needs. So outreach is really important. And then we try to connect them with transportation appointments um, and whatever encouragement they need on their journey toward housing. So we go out to them, but then another piece of this is that they come to us and the Community First Center, which you can see it's in the bottom right hand corner, that picture there is of our Community First Center, which is located at 520 North Spring Street. And it's open several times a week and folks can come in. This week we've had 100 unique individuals who have come into the Community First Center. We um, actually have mail for about 300 people because you can't get food stamps if you don't have an address. If, you, if you're homeless, <laughs> you don't have an address, you can't get food stamps. So about 300 folks use our mail services so that they have a place to receive their important papers. Um, and we also, that's where we sort of help them navigate. Um, we, we connect them to shelter, connect them to food, to clothing, to health resources. Those are the primary things. We work on their vital documents. Likewise, if you don't have a birth certificate, you can't get too far in the housing process, right? And, you know, getting a copy of your birth certificate can sometimes be a fairly complex process. Um, so we help with those kinds of things. Um, we, we do not do the work for them. We walk alongside them and we serve as sort of navigators. Um, but that's another form of outreach that we're doing. Um, and then, of course, we still do what we call the overflow shelter. Um, we're in the middle of that season right now, began in December 15th. Um, we've had 270 unique individuals come through overnight shelter so far this year. Um, and that's in addition to, you know, the traditional shelter, Salvation Army takes families, Samaritan Ministry takes men, and the Bethesda Center takes men and women. They're, all their capacity is lower now because of COVID. Um, and recently we had a COVID outbreak in those shelters and they shut down completely. So the overflow shelter was really kind of the place to be um, this winter uh, if you wanted to have a warm, uh, warm mattress and a hot, and a, what a hot in a cot, they call it, hot meal in a cot. Um, so we are in the throes of that right now. And then the final program that we really do um, do work on is what we call the HEART Project. HEART stands for Housing Emergency Assisted Rapid Response Team. And it's essentially a supportive housing program. We recognize that the folks that we work with, particularly the, our older, more medically fragile, chronically homeless folks, uh, you can't just set them in an apartment and say, see you later. Uh, they need a lot of help relative to, you know, activities of daily living. Um, they need help navigating transportation, uh, their finances. A lot of them have never used a debit card. Um, you know, um, grocery shopping, figuring out what to buy and how to cook it and make something of it. Um, developing hobbies, developing friendships and being part of a regular community, whether that's a church or a club or something else. These are things we have a staff of two that are peer support folks. That means they've had lived experiences as, as, with being homeless. Um, and they work with these guys to help them uh, navigate daily living as a house person, because it is quite an adjustment. And if we don't want them to fall out the other end, we really do need to work with them as they're housed. So, so those are the, the things that we are doing, um, you know, uh, you know, every day, all year um, to work with our friends experiencing homelessness. Um, and here are just some of the things that of things that maybe ways that you can help and uh, and sort of based on your comfort level. Right. You could do some direct service. You can come and volunteer for us. Ask Nat about that. He's come and worked at our community first center as a volunteer. Uh, you can give us actual dollars, directly contribute to our work. Um, you know, you could do some indirect service. Um, and churches love indirect service, collecting needed items, right? Um, fundraising events that benefit our work. Um, staying in tune with some of the specific needs, um, you know, in order to help us. You can, you can do advocacy work, lobbying for policy change. Um, holding maybe a Zoom party or a house party to tell your friends about some of these issues of importance. Um, and then, you know, you can also just sort of start with some research, right? Look, read a couple books, dive, or dive a little deeper into some of these issues that perked your attention tonight. Um, and, uh, you know, sort of figure out the intersectionality between homelessness and poverty. Explore that a little more. Um, so these are all sort of ways that you can serve 
Specifically, when it comes to city with dwellings, of course, I would like to have your dollars. Um, I, I'm, you know, I'm directly pitching for money. I will say with COVID came a lot of money. We were able to do the medically fragile hotel project really only because we got a tremendous amount of money from HUD to do it. And a lot of the HUD money is running out now that, you know, COVID's kind of, we hope, on its way out the door. Uh, a lot of that money is going to be running out. And so we, we need direct support from folks um, to make sure that we can continue because, you know, even though COVID is leaving, um, the needs that COVID has created have not have not left and in fact growing. So um, we have really more unsheltered homeless on the street now than ever before. Um, uh, so, and then I've got the, um, the little eyeglass down there at the bottom. We always need stuff, but it's very specific stuff. So I recommend you go to our website. We have under give, we have an in-kind giving tab and we have a move-in kits tab that shares very specific things that we could use. For example, reading glasses. We always need reading glasses um, because our folks lose them, you know, just like, oh yeah. Um, you know, uh, so we always need reading glasses. Um, we always need coffee supplies. We always need bottled water. I mean, there's some things that, you know, typically we need. We don't typically take clothing and things like that because we prefer to send folks to our partners like Sunnyside or Green Street and some of those kind of places that have clothing closets. We're not a clothing closet. We're really there to help navigate our friends through this sort of housing maze that they're on. Um, but then, of course, the, the volunteer tree is there with all the helping hands. And we could, we need you, we could use you. And there are a variety of ways to serve, everything from bringing meals to the overflow shelter uh, to come into the CFC and um, helping someone figure out how to get their birth certificate. I mean, they're, they're, and then we, we continue to expand our volunteer opportunities and are hoping in the next year or to be able to do, have more volunteers working in the HEART project, which is the supportive housing piece of all of this. Uh, which really does take a tremendous amount of, uh, it takes a village definitely to keep someone in housing who's been homeless for a long time. So, so those are some tangible suggestions for you. Um, and then here are some resources for you. And when I stop sharing my screen, I'll drop some links in the chat for you. But there aren't a lot of great books on homelessness, I will say. A lot of them are either very academic or or they're more about working in the system. But these are two I would commend to you if you're, if you're a reader and interested in doing more of a deep dive. Uh, Homelessness is a Housing Problem is coming out, I think, in March. Uh, and then Evicted, I highly recommend. It's a, a journalist wrote it. He was in Milwaukee and he created relationships with landlords and tenants. And he explores just sort of the whole uh, intersection, I guess, of poverty and housing uh, and the vicious cycle that people get into as it relates to eviction. It's, it's a compelling read and I, I do highly recommend it. It's very good. And then the other places listed here are just various resources that can give us lots of facts, studies, ideas. Um, invisiblepeople.tv is a great little website. You can get a lot more videos like Lee's or the people talking about their experience of being homeless and it, it's very compelling and interesting. Um, so there's just a variety of things um, to be learned and discovered relative to resources. And of course, the City with Dwellings website has a lot of good local resource information on it too. And I, I finish up with the quote I shared when I was here for your Sunday school class from Henry Nowen about community, because that's really what um, City with Dwellings is trying to do. We're trying to create and sustain supportive community um, because we are alive, not for ourselves, but for one another. So. Um, I just leave you with that thought and I'm happy to answer questions um, as best I can. So I will stop sharing my screen. Anyone have any questions? Yes. Let me ask Ruth. Ruth, is uh, homelessness increasing, decreasing or uh, static in numbers? It's increasing. Uh, and what's happening, I mean, what we're seeing, I, I actually just saw some numbers um, on our point in time count. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but the way that HUD wants us to count people is one night a year in January. Volunteers go out and literally do a like a census of folks who are experiencing homelessness. Um, that hasn't happened as much during COVID. We're one of the few communities that really keeps up so well with who our unsheltered homeless folks are that HUD uses those numbers and we don't have to necessarily go out in the cold. But I've noticed lately here um, that we have about, about 550 folks in Winston-Salem that are homeless on any given night. 
uh, usually about 250, 260 are in shelters. So they're sheltered homeless. And then another 250 are unsheltered homeless. Um, and that's, that's a higher number. Um, uh, to shelters, you know, their capacity has actually dropped because of COVID. So those numbers are actually going down, but the unsheltered numbers are going up. So, um, but overall, it's definitely going up. What are some of the policy changes that are needed? I saw that in one of your slides. I mean, I, I do think we have to explore the universal housing assistance and some of that kind of stuff. I mean, I think we have to get a little better at um, um, getting assistance directly to the renter. Um, you know, um, with, with the housing voucher system, the way it works now, the landlord's really in control. You've got to find a landlord who'll take a housing voucher, first of all, <laughs> right? Um, and, and, and then it's a contingent on inspections and lots of other things. If the control and the money was with the renter, the renter would have a little more uh, of an ability to be able to you know, figure out where they want to live and go and how much they can afford and do that. So I think, I think policy change related to that. I think, um, I don't think we can rely completely on the private sector to build the affordable housing that's needed. I think it's going to have to be a collaborative effort of some kind. Um, so I think those, that's, you know, that's the kind of thing that's got to happen. We just got to invest a little more. But when, when you think about the tremendous cost, I mean, I'll just Mentioned, for example, some of our chronically homeless folks, people who've been homeless for 10, 20 years, they may go in and out of the hospital three or four times in the course of one year. And I'm sure Keith could speak to this, but it's very expensive. I mean, it's costing someone a lot of money. And if we could take even just a percentage of that that's being spent, because we're, we're, what's happening is people are hospitalized and then they're getting dumped in our parking lot or dumped in the Bethesda parking lot or they're going back to their bridge and then the next time they're in the hospital the cycle repeats um, at a tremendous cost to both the individual and the community. So figuring out how we can reinvest some of that cost, you know, in, in solutions that actually will, will work for folks. Those are a couple of examples. Ruth, do you have a recurring giving option? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, if you go to the website, to the donate page, you can do it through PayPal. And when you do your first donation, there's a place you can just check and say, make this a monthly gift. And then it'll just automatically take it out um, through PayPal. Well, thank you. But you don't have to have a PayPal, I don't think, for it to do that. Because we have the account. <clears throat> Great question, Peggy. <laughs> have have you, you heard any? Have you heard anything about the tiny house project, I think it's in California, in Los Angeles area, where they were trying to do tiny houses for the chronically homeless. Yeah, there are the ones that are one or two people. There are a lot of different, I, I mean, I've seen a lot of creative solutions around small living areas. Um, and, you know, and I think those can be fairly successful. And they, they do require, again, the supportive housing piece. You know, you can't just throw somebody in a tiny house um, and expect them to be successful. There has to be the program support. And I will say it is pretty difficult to support a chronically homeless person in a house. <laughs> it is hard work and it is not easy. Um, you know, one of our fellows in the Heart Project, he just was hospitalized. He's a diabetic. Uh, he won't quit drinking, uh, which is fine. That's his choice. Um, but he was just hospitalized and lost several toes because, you know, he's a bad diabetic and he checked himself out of the hospital against medical advice. And I mean, you know, it's, it's some of the stories are just really amazing, but our peer support folks do a great job. So it's just, it's just not a matter. It's just not as simple as finding a place for them to be. There has to also be that supportive community uh, when services, you know, we need the mental health services and the substance abuse services, and then access to the basics, clothing, food, you know, shelter. So it's, it's, uh, it's complex and layered and expensive. Others, other questions? <clears throat> Well, Ruth, um, oh, Amy, go ahead. Yeah, um, when the, if the Salvation Army homeless shelter shut down, were families with children, I mean, did they get 
you know, some kind of temporary housing or what happened with, I mean, did children go into the overflow shelters with their parents? No, our overflow shelters are very, very much divided up into men's shelter and women's shelter. Um, we don't even put couples together in that setting. It just doesn't really work. I don't think the Salvation Army ever closed um, due to COVID. They, they drastically reduced their um, capacity though. And um, what we have had here recently, and I don't know where the funding came from, but um, we had some emergency hotel vouchers for families. Um, I think right now we have 24 families in emergency hotel. Um, we don't deal much with, with families because um, most of the time, hopefully their situation is somewhat, they're somewhat briefly homeless. You know, hopefully it's a situation or they can get a place in the shelter so that they can work on getting jobs and kind of getting back out there. We work with working mostly with unsheltered homeless. Very few families stay unsheltered for long, thankfully. Um, but yeah, I, but I don't know how long the funding is going to be lasting for the family vouchers. But, you know, that's what that's what they've been doing here lately. And I will say, if you're if you're interested in volunteering, but you're just not quite sure, um, on the website there's a volunteer tab, and you can sign up to come to one of our orientations. We do an orientation every month, typically it's just an hour in the afternoon, and you can just come hear more about us, see the center, maybe sign up for a shift, um, and just get to get to see because it's it's not for everybody volunteering with this group, um, although they are really quite lovely um uh folks um but you know i understand that it isn't for everybody but just you know come on learn some more figure out what the different roles are and maybe where you might want to play a role and ask nat to tell you what he's been doing and how he likes it ruth can you uh, explain to us uh, the difference between and also the likenesses of the dwelling, the church, the dwelling, and the city with dwellings, because I think sometimes people are confused about that. Yeah, it is confusing. Um, Emily Norris is the pastor of the dwelling, which is the church community for our unsheltered homeless population. And they share offices with us. They have their, like their administrative offices are in our building. And then they also worship in our building on Sundays and have a meal after worship. They have about a hundred folks who come to worship. Um, every Sunday. They have a very active community. Some of them are housed, uh, some of them are volunteers, some of them are just community folk. Um, and Emily is, aside from being a Lutheran pastor, she is also uh, quarter time as our communications person at City with Dwellings. And she was a founding board member of City with Dwellings. So there are, it's very tight. And um, when she was naming the dwelling, she said she just couldn't come up with a better word than dwelling um, for naming it that, but it has created confusion. But the dwelling is a project of the Moravian Lutherans together. It's like the Lutheran mission and the Moravian Emerging Ministry. Um, it's, uh, although I think the Lutherans really are maybe putting in a little more than the, than the Moravians at this point, but um, it's a combined uh, ministry and, and Emily is the pastor. Maddie White, who's a candidate for Moravian ministry is the student pastor there. Um, and then they have a shower truck ministry. They take a shower truck out to uh, Samaritan Ministries once a week, and then they have it at, at our building on Sunday so folks can take a shower, um, which is something that there aren't many places to do when you don't have a house. So it's a wonderful ministry. You know, this is a, homelessness is a huge, huge issue subject to talk about and it's also hugely important to talk about so I really appreciate um, what Tom shared with us and then Ruth all of what you brought to us um, we we just need to know more about this we need to be more involved and you've given us some good options so thank you so much and I, I know everyone realizes if you want to follow up with Ruth or with the website or you know whatever you want to do there by all means um, you do that and see where your role can be. So I guess we um, say thank you to both of you and to all y'all for being here and we'll see you next week. Or Margaret, you have something to share? And yes, thank you, Donna. And thank you, Ruth. And thank you, Tom. And Tom is gonna share briefly about next week. Uh, next week, I will be talking about 
some of our ch most cherished Moravian hymns, which are actually not Moravian. We have reached out to different distant parts of the Christian church and found hymns that express our own faith in these distant parts. One of these places is a monastery in the year uh, 900. And uh, Morning Star is one of the, the texts. Uh, of course, the music is by a Moravian, but the texts are by, is by a Roman Catholic physician of the 1600s. So we wanna look at these hymns and explore the imagery in them, try to understand the imagery better, the meaning and the theology. We as Moravians say, well, we sing our theology. Maybe we should think about what we're singing. Thank you, Tom. And Ruth just put some information in the chat as well. And uh, next week will be our last week on Zoom for a while. 